Amanda Weinstein, uh, welcome back to Against All Enemies. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Ken? Uh, okay, but I, I hate having to do this. I think we need to talk about Moms for Liberty again. And I'm going to play again. a quick video again because they are still at it. Get a load of this, and then I want your reaction. Hang on. Let's hear it. I don't know what to say. There is always a bridge. There is always a reason. There is always a reason why something happens. Right? Yes. One of our moms in a newsletter post Hitler. Woo! Woo! I stand with that mom. Yes. So I think it's the cheering as much as anything that bothers me. I'll I'll put it in the show notes, but it's at a Moms for Liberty conference. The speaker says one of our moms quotes Hitler in a newsletter. There's a whoop. First of all, you hear that pretty clearly. And then she says she stands with that mom and the crowd lights up. Um, They I mean, I guess this is part of the new M.O., right? When you step in it, you don't retreat. You just keep going. You don't back down. If anything, you double down on (laughs) on quoting Hitler. I, is the am I right? Am I um am I being too harsh on him? No, I think that's spot on. And actually I think it's a little bit worse cuz the mom who originally did quote Hitler, at first she did try and walk it back. But it was so disingenuous that it didn't work. So now they just kind of throw their hands up and now they're saying, "Well, actually we do really like Hitler." The other piece of this that I think you're going to be able to provide special insight on is the religious overtone, right? This video starts out with the speaker saying, God always has a plan. And then it Im- immediately pivots to to Hitler quotes. And I'm just trying to help people understand this, this religious overtone, this idea that they are doing God's work. It's one thing, I guess, to be a three percenter and, you know, strut around in your body armor and tactical gear. But you're not, you know, invoking some divine call to action with that cosplay. Moms for Liberty and adjacent groups really claim to be doing the Lord's work in banning these book and targeting kids. Where does that come from? Oh, man, where do we start? I could do a whole lecture on that, but I won't. <laughs> but this has been going on for quite some time where we see this kind of almost like militaristic religious infrastructure where we have this merging of religion and politics so much so to the point that the religion itself is almost not identifiable from where Christianity was even just three, four decades ago. And this has been a clear effort for people in the religious community and people on the right to create this weird monstrosity of this religious political infrastructure. And we've seen it with a lot of organizations, uh, but we see it even with the homeschooling movement. In Ohio, we have homeschoolers who profess to train your kids to be Nazis. We have, And they have thousands and thousands of members homeschooling. So if you saw the documentary, Shiny Happy People with the Duggars, and we think, oh, they're just, you know, 20 kids and counting Duggars, right? They're just cute, a cute, happy family, right? But no, there's more to this. It is all very, very calculated. And Kristen Dumais' book, uh, Jesus and John Wayne, just details the entire history of this trying to bring religion into politics. And so much so that even you had one of the Grams said, you know, I worry about politics and religion coming together. And this is exactly what the worry was when suddenly religion is no longer identifiable as religion. We had uh, we had Kristen Dumay on the show, and she <gasps> love her. She's I don't know if fabulous. she yeah she's fantastic. I don't know if, I don't know if she coins the phrase militant Christianity, but she sure makes good use of it. And she documents along with Angela Danker, a pastor in the same vein, this really alarming observation that in America today, at least on the right, when your politics conflict with your faith. Whether you realize it, realize it or not, most people choose their politics. And I guess it's because politics has even stronger tribal ties 
than whatever faith tradition they they claim. Do you see that uh, as well in in suburban Ohio? Absolutely, right? Politics is uh, a team sport, right? You're rooting for your team. Uh, So we had economist Justin Wolfer recently said, you know, you're not going to see Republicans say the economy is going great, even though it is going great, because that's like, you know, if you're a Michigan fan, that's like saying Ohio State is doing great, right? It might be true, but you're not going to say it because they're not in your team. And we have these team identities stronger than anything else, just kind of built in us. And religion is really not about teams as much. It's about let's welcome all, right? All are welcome in our doors, right? So it makes it hard to be a team sport when you're like, well, but everyone's welcome here. How effective do you think Moms for Liberty will be going into 2024? On paper, they're growing, they're opening chapters. It seems like Everywhere, there's obviously been a backlash as the truth about them slowly is coming out. Are you worried about their political relevance and power going into this this epic election season? I wish I could say no, but I absolutely am. And here's why. If you look at the history of both parties, there has been this huge gap of where women really didn't play a significant role. And if you see that gap and that there's a place to fill it, which is what they see, right? They're seeing like, oh, we can fill this gap. Women have something to say. Women have values and they have preferences. And in large part, a lot of women have been completely ignored from politics since the dawn of all time. And this goes back even to before Roe v. Wade. Uh, It goes back when Roe v. Wade was overturned. And you see even people in the Democratic Party saying things like, oh, you know, those silly women, they'll forget about it. It's not going to change elections that much. They were wrong. Right. And they're going to continue to be wrong if they don't realize that women have something to say and they have values and they want to be heard and they are filling that gap. And if the Democratic Party can't fill that gap, then Republicans have found a way to fill that gap. Well, whether it was driven by the Democratic Party as an organization, or if it was largely organic, suburban women and their backlash against the the revanchism and the extremism of the Republican Party played a huge role in stemming that red wave in 2022. Suburban women are always being pointed at as that key block that is going to stop Republican or one of the key blocks that's going to stop Republican extremism. You have a podcast about this. What is Moms for Liberty appealing to? What is the draw? Is is that a subset that is just, well, I'm going to let you answer the, the question. I, I don't get the attraction. I mean, a lot of it is for moms, our kids are important. So if our kids are important, then things like their schools are important right? De facto. And what we see is when we see underpaid teachers, mostly women, underpaid schools who are teaching our kids, when we see disinvestment from schools, from higher education, we don't see that people are valuing our children and what's going on with our children, right? So this is an easy one for Dems. Great. Let's increase school funding. Let's pay teachers fairly. But without a lot of big push on that, It just feels like no one's listening. And so then what we get to is, all right, well, I'm really listening. And the real kind of the real issue here is if we don't have the conversation. Sometimes I think we are so afraid to have the conversation that they win just because we're not willing to speak up. So that's what I think we saw with the Virginia governor's race, that when we started talking about CRT, a lot of people just said, well, that's not a thing. We're not going to talk about it. But the problem is there were women who wanted to have that conversation and talk about it. And not having the conversation is worse than having the conversation. In other places where we did have the conversation, even in my own suburb, right, we said, hey, let's have this conversation. Here's what's really going on in our schools. Here's what's going on with our teachers. And we crushed it. That It went away like it never happened. No one talks about CRT in our schools that I know of, at least not out loud, right? Because we had the conversation. The problem is when we're not willing to have the conversation. I think the race issue is such a powerful undercurrent in, in all of the Moms for Liberty stuff. When you look at the books they're targeting, overwhelmingly addressing, uh, written by people of color or addressing issues in, in those communities the fact that they won't let stories about Ruby Bridges be taught. Toni Morrison, fellow Ohioan, is on the banned books 
list. Can you talk about this thread of racism that runs through Moms for Liberty? Oh, the, all the isms. There's racism. There's also f- homophobia, fear of anyone that's different. And if you want to know how someone feels, right, you can look at how they're trying to make you feel, right? They're trying to make people feel scared of something, of something that they don't know. And that's how they feel. They feel scared of something that they don't know. But the truth is the way that how they're reacting to it is by their choosing to react to that. Well, then I am going to, if I don't like this book, because I don't understand it, because it's different and I don't know about it, right? Then I'm going to take that book away from everybody. So one of the best lines of kind of, you know, responses that we had is, if you don't want your child to read a book, I don't know any teacher who said, who would say, you know, fine, your child doesn't have to read a book. But if you don't want your child to read a book, it doesn't mean you get to take away from my child. Somewhere the entire Republican Party has decided that their freedom really only means taking the freedom from others, right? So if they don't have the freedom to push it on you, then that's not true freedom for them, right? And so that's a big issue. And I think that's a conversation we really haven't had, that your parenting freedom ends at me as a parent. You can, if you don't want to read the book, don't read the book, but don't tell me what I can or can't read or what my kid can or can't read. That's just ridiculous. And we don't see a lot of strong pushback on that. And look, not every book is for you, right? So, you know, if you're not a black woman or your child is not a black child or you don't have a trans kid, right? That book might be for another child. It might not be for you. And that's okay. Not everything has to be for you. Some books can act as, you know, mirrors for people where they can see themselves in it. And that's important for a lot of kids, maybe not their kids, but someone else's kid. And, but they can also act as windows where maybe they can understand a little more. What is so striking about so many of these book bans and book ban efforts is that when you, when you actually interrogate the the folks who are pushing them, they haven't read the books. They don't know what they're talking about. They know the one-liners they've been told. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Let's yep. pivot uh, briefly in the time we have left. Uh, you're a, an Air Force vet. Um, we're watching this ridiculous saga play out in D.C. now of a lone senator holding up promotions for senior military officers so that for the first time in American history, the commandant of the Marine Corps, there isn't one. The The outgoing commandant left The picture on the wall at the Pentagon is blank because of one senator's political vanity and ambition, Tommy Tuberville from uh, Alabama. Can you just briefly describe why he's pulling this stunt? I mean, so you have him pulling a stunt, which let's also be clear that this stunt affects real people, real people's careers, not just any people, veterans. So I really hate to hear the trope of support our troops when we have someone doing this that is clearly not supporting our troops. This puts troops in danger when we don't have a commandant and it's totally messing with people's careers, which a lot of people kind of ignore that even when everything went down with Alex Vindman testifying, who is his career was essentially destroyed because of this. Very little was said about the fact of just screwing with veterans and their careers, right? So you have hanging, you know, the careers of veterans and active duty militaries, you know, in there. Uh, of just not having a leader, not having leadership, all just so he can make a point about abortion and that he doesn't want to fund abortion and he doesn't want to fund abortions for veterans or abortions for military members. He doesn't want to fund any abortions. I'm sure he would have them all go away that minute. The problem is, is sometimes military members need abortions. Sometimes they're miscarrying. Sometimes their lives are at stake. And we don't get that person who, you know, has the nuclear codes, knows how to use the nukes or knows how to fly that jet who just happens to be a woman right now. And what they have a hard time understanding is that abortion care truly is health care. And I know Republicans hate to hear that, but it truly is. And our veterans need health care. This is why we have the VA. So to deny any military member, any veteran, any type of health care is completely wrong and against the mission of the VA and the military. Worth reminding folks, and we did an episode on this last week, but Senator Tuberville from Alabama is the same one who, when asked if there should be white nationalists in the military, said, I don't see white nationalists, I see Americans. And and it's all connected, right? This, this strain of extremism that wants to control women, that excuses white supremacy, it's all connected. 
it's all connected. So if you look at polls of people's feelings on abortion, the number one thing that can predict if you are anti-abortion is misogyny. It's nothing else. It's not the life of the baby. It's not the lives of women. It's just pure misogyny is the number one predictor of are you anti-abortion or not. And the control goes for anyone who is different, anyone who's basically not the hetero, cis, white, male, whatever that they are, right? And part of it is, is yeah, the world looks different. They have to actually compete now. And it's scary when you have to compete against women and men who don't look like you and they might actually beat you and you have to think about things for a while. And that's really scary. So the way that they have to push back on that is control, whether that's through abortion or that's through these book bans or attacking LGBTQ kids or minority kids. All of this is control because they're scared of a world that they think is changing and passing them by. Well, thanks so much, Amanda, for the insights, for the updates. Hopefully next week we can pivot away from Moms for Liberty. Uh, they'll probably oh. still be at it, but uh, good talking. They'll to be you. around. They will. Thank you. Thanks, Ken.